Praise the Lord and welcome to the streams of grace. Let us place ourselves at the foot of the cross. Because at the foot of the cross, we can truly witness the power of God's goodness. Mary Magdalene standing at the foot of the cross, a woman of shame, a woman engulfed in pain, by the graces of the cross, became the first apostle of the resurrection. John, standing at the foot of the cross, overwhelmed by suffering, overwhelmed by the evil around him, by the graces of the cross, got a vision of the heart of God and became a prophet of love. Mother Mary, standing at the foot of the cross, her heart torn by a sword of pain, here at the cross, became the mother of the entire church, blessed in every generation. The centurion, blinded by the passing glory of the world, at the foot of the cross received sight. He could see in Jesus, the Son of God. He got a vision of salvation. As we place ourselves at the foot of the cross, let us place before God our blindness, where we struggle with the fascinations and the preoccupations of the passing world. Let's place before God our shame, our pain, that sorrow which is so deep, which refuses to go, that wound that still controls us, the evil that we are shocked by. Let's bring this to the Lord. Oh God, by the grace of your cross, of your love, of your suffering, of your death and your resurrection. Give us the grace to live this love. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'd like to begin this sharing with a beautiful story, a real story set during the war. It is of a young couple who were deeply in love with each other. They were to get married. The engagement was done. All the preparations of the wedding had begun. The wedding dress was stitched. The invitation cards were being prepared. The guest list was done. And now they were counting the days for the wedding. And it was at this time that their country was going to war. And the young man had to enroll in the army. He had to go for war. And suddenly everything had changed. The whole country was dipped in gloom, and especially this family, especially these two people, waiting for their day of joy, which was now postponed indefinitely. Everyone was sad. The boy was sad, and especially the girl was shattered. She was very sad because she did not know whether he would ever come back from the war. She had all sorts of fears. She did not know in what condition he would come back, when he would come back. She was really sad. But the day before he left for the war, he came and visited her. And he spoke to her for a while. He told her, he said, I want something from you. And she said, you know, I love you. You know, I would do anything from you, for you. He said, I want you to promise me that when I am gone, you would remember the beautiful dreams we shared and you would prepare yourself because he said, I know in my heart I will come back. And he says, as soon as I come back, we'll get married. You be prepared. You be prepared as soon as we come back. There should be no delay. We'll have a simple service and we'll be married. Now this gave her a lot of hope and he told her also, I don't want you to be sad. I don't want you to be grieving. But I want you to be preparing. And she was ready for that. She wished him goodbye. And every day that he was gone, she would remember the beautiful dreams they shared, the kind of house they would build, the number of children they would have, and all those things that only love can manufacture in our imagination. So the days passed by, weeks passed by, months passed, 
And then suddenly there was an announcement that the war is over. There was a lot of relief, especially for the families that had sent their children to the war or a member in the family for war. And there was a date set when the soldiers were to return. On the day prior to this return, where everyone was preparing for the return of the soldiers, on the day prior to that, a list was released, a list of those who were killed in the war. And someone from this family casually went and looked up that list. And to their horror, they saw the name of this young man with his number. So there was no doubt, his identity number. And they did not know, this person did not know how to break the news to the girl. So he spoke to the family members and they decided, because this girl was awaiting the return of her beloved the next day, so they decided that night itself they would speak to her. And that night they gently, you know, began talking to her about the possibilities of the outcome of war. But she was so sure he would return. And then finally they told her in clear terms what they saw. And she was shattered. She was shattered because she had built her entire life on those dreams and on this love. She went into her room and shut the door. And throughout the night she wept and wept and wept. In the early hours of the morning, she lifted up her eyes and through the morning light, she could see the picture of both of them taken on their day of engagement. And a great desire gripped her heart that once in her life, she should be the bride. She proceeded, she opened her cupboard, took out the wedding gown that was waiting. She wore it on, she arranged her veil. And then to a music that was there in her heart, she stretched out her hand and was quietly dancing in her own room with the man she held in her heart. This was going on for some time. She was reliving all her dreams as she was dancing. At one moment, she heard a big noise. She turned and she was shocked. She saw the door of her room was pushed open and she could see the figure of someone so familiar. And she realized the man whom everyone thought and said was dead was there alive. And she was so happy. She was laughing and then she was crying and laughing again. She was crying again. She couldn't speak. She couldn't move from where she was. And this young man, he stood over there, neither laughing nor crying, just shocked. And after a long, long while, he opened his mouth and he spoke. And he told her, you know, my sweetheart, I told you when I come back, be prepared. As soon as I come back, we'd get married. But I never imagined that you'd be so prepared. The man had returned from the war front straight to see his beloved. And he saw her there in her wedding gown her arms stretched out. A beautiful story, but something that really reminds us of what the Lord wants from us. Jesus tells us, he tells us that we should be ready, prepared for the coming of the Lord. We do not know when he would come back and we do not need to know. Really, we do not need to know this. But what we need to be busy about is ensuring that we are prepared, prepared for the coming of the Lord. When the Lord comes, he should find us fit enough to enter his glory. Now, what is it that will make me fit enough to enter his glory? Will it be the bank account I have? Definitely, you and I know it's not so. Will it be the people we have in our life? Will it be the position I have acquired? Whatever we are striving for, whatever we are striving for in our daily life, for success, for that prosperity? Will it be the amount of friends we have, the amount of goodwill we enjoy? No. Will it be the number of hours I pray? 
Will it be like recorded? Oh, yes, you've done two hours today and you've been doing two hours every day. Wonderful. No. Will it be the kind of gifts I have, the spiritual gifts? Will it be the kind of sacrifices I make? Well, actually, no. Scripture is very clear that when the Lord comes, he will assess us on one account. And St. Paul puts it so beautifully. In the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, he says, If I speak in human and angelic tongues and do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I own, and if I hand my body over so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Ultimately, what the Lord is looking from me is whether I have love. And what is this love? For many of us, love is an abstract idea. Maybe we equate love with the teenage fascination of two young people in an, in an infatuation. Very commonly, we associate love with sweetness. But St. Paul continues to say, love is about being patient. In the midst of circumstances that would naturally make you impatient, love is what keeps you patient. When you're faced with rudeness, he says, love is about kindness. Love is about rejoicing over the good in the others. Love is about not getting jealous. Love is not about raising yourself and being pompous. Love is not about getting angry, quick temper, or over keeping any bitterness in our heart. Love is not about evil. Love is about being good in the trying circumstances. He says, love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love is about strength. The strength that we saw Jesus having on the way to the cross and through his hours of suffering. The patience that Jesus had when he was carrying the cross is all recorded there in the Bible. He's carrying the cross, going through all the humiliation, suffering so much of pain. And yet, whenever he opened his mouth, whatever he expressed was gracious. He meets the women, the, the sorrowful women of Jerusalem, and he consoles them. I remember when... Um, the year 2005, a group of us had gone to Germany for the World Youth Day. And the last day we had this pilgrimage. It was a 17-kilometer walk that most of us were not used to. And we had all our luggage, all our luggage to drag along. I remember as we were walking along, you know, it was so difficult. And I could not appreciate the scenery I could not appreciate the pilgrimage. And we had a guide, a priest who was guiding our group. And every time I manage to get near him, I will tell, Father, how much more? How many more kilometers? How much have we covered? As if he was a, a compass. And I was so irritated. I was thinking, why did I bring so much of luggage? Oh, why did these organizers do something so cruel as to make us walk so long? And finally, I lost my way. Love is patient. Love is patient. Love is about climbing that mountain, going through all those hardships, but being able to be gracious. Love demands a strength that is not really within us. And that is why, that is why the Bible tells us that love is a fruit of the Spirit. Love is a fruit of the Spirit. Why are we being judged by love? Because Love, this kind of Christian love, love in the face of unpleasant circumstances, this love is a proof of whether I'm deeply rooted in the Lord. We have learned this. When the tree is deeply rooted, getting its nutrients, getting its water, 
getting the sunlight, it bears fruit. If my religion is beyond the superficiality, if my religion has given me deep roots, a connection with God, I will be bearing the fruit of love. And that is why Jesus tells us, he says, I give you the Holy Spirit, the power from above, the superior strength. I give it to you that you will be my witnesses. Remember this promise. He calls the disciples, the risen Lord. He calls the disciples together and he commands them. He says, wait and pray so that you are clothed with the superior power, the power from above, the supreme power. And he says, when you receive this power, it shall be so that you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Witnesses of love. And witnesses, firstly, in Jerusalem. It's not a coincidence. It's not an accident that Jesus first mentions Jerusalem because you and I, we need to be missionaries of love Witnesses of love, firstly in our home, firstly in our present circumstances, where we work, with whom we live. We have very often seen perhaps a person preaching great ideas of love, standing up as a witness of Christ, or perhaps, you know, spearheading a great social movement and being a total failure at home. So what happens? Such a person who preaches love, who preaches goodness, who preaches noble values and does not live it, is the greatest enemy of the very message. The child, for instance, of a preacher is preaching about, his lo about love and about God, and his children see him not living that message, they would think this message is unlivable. That is why we need to first be witnesses of love in our difficult, immediate circumstances. Love is not merely about feeling compassion about a victim in Syria. Love is not feeling compassion for those sad things that we see abroad. Love is about being compassionate to the people at home, to the spouse who could be irritating, being patient with them, about being generous to the very people who fare badly by our expectations to the child who does not listen, to the domestic help. How do I treat my servants? The domestic help who perhaps doesn't like to do work, to the salesperson who's annoying us, to those people perhaps in our workplace or in our community who gossip about us, who try to work against us. Love is about being good to them, about being kind to them. Love, as Jesus said, is about loving the neighbor. And as Jesus would tell clearly in Matthew 25, 40, in that parable about the judgment of the nations, he says, what you do to the least of my brethren is what you do to me. And because of what you do to them, you will be judged either favorably or unfavorably by God. And the least of the brethren is not merely the poor and the marginalized. The least of the brethren are those who are least in our estimation. Maybe they're poor, they're ugly, they're sinful, they're unpleasant. It could be someone in our own house. But it is about whether I can be loving to them. I can honor them. When Jesus said, judge not, there was no qualification. Whether the person was unrighteous, unworthy, Unpleasant, I'm supposed to be not judging, but honoring them. This is the love that you and I have to live. When we talk about loving the neighbor, we really need to look into three things. To this journey, this, this pilgrimage of love that we need to take up. The first thing is to be able to give people the benefit of doubt. Very often when people hurt us, we react we condemn, we, we understand that they are against us. But perhaps they are going through their own struggle. And what we see is just an expression of them going through their struggles. Maybe a person doesn't smile at you. It could be that they are having something else in their mind, some other questions. 
Maybe they are rude to you. Well, you don't know what their story is, what they have gone through. So the second thing is walk a mile in their shoes. When a person is insulting, a person is hateful, a person is perhaps, as you see, you know, totally against us, we need to walk in their shoes. Perhaps they've gone through hurts, and if we were in their situation, we would have definitely have fared worse. The third thing is, we need to consider them as our own. Suppose you see a person in your neighborhood, a cantankerous old man, unpleasant, Perhaps you're wishing for him to die. Just imagine for a moment, he was your own dad. He was your own best friend. We would know how to excuse this person. Or we look at an in-law, a mother-in-law, a daughter-in-law, a father-in-law who's very difficult, says nasty things, does nasty things. Well, if it was your own daughter, if it was your own mother or your own dad, we would try to cover up for them, right? Or we see a, a drug addict in the neighborhood and, and we, are just, we just want him to be taken by the police. He's such a nuisance. He's a danger. But if this person were my own brother, and if I am a loving family member, I would do everything in my power to see him happy, to see him restored, to see him accepted. If the person is our own, the way would, we would react would be very different. It would be love. I was so shocked recently, some months ago, when I read in the news about an incident in my city where I come from. A girl had gone to work early morning in the railway station. She's knifed by a stranger. And she's lying there bleeding. She bled for a few hours and died. And it was not a deserted railway station. It was in the heart of the city. And there were people there who heard what happened, who saw what happened, and just got into their trains and went to work. They did not want to get involved. Some weeks later, an 11-year-old student with her mother on the bike traveling on the road was hit by a truck. And in that accident, the girl is lying there. They were lying for an hour or so in the road. And finally, an ambulance comes and takes them to the hospital. And the doctor tells the mother, if you had come just 15 minutes earlier, we could have saved the daughter. How do you console this mother? Well, we could justify the rules of our road are like this. It's so complicated to help a person who's caught in an accident. The rules of, you know, the rules of the police is so difficult. The, the rules in the hospital is difficult. But if this girl was our own daughter, our own sister, how would we react? We would abandon everything else to help that person. When I read this news, I thought, yes, there was no good Samaritan passing that way. Surely this human coldness would have always been there. That's why Jesus spoke about it. But the fact is also that we have become desensitized. Everywhere we see, we see crime, we see news of all sorts of ugly situations. And we've become so used to this kind of evil that we don't react anymore. For us to once again become compassionate, we need to look at Jesus on the cross. We need to see him raised up on the cross we need to see how he lived his life in love. And as we keep our eyes on him, we will reflect that love, as Mother Teresa did. She kept meditating on Christ on the cross, of him crying out, I thirst. As she looked at him, she began to reflect him. When we begin to reflect Jesus, who lived for love, who died for love, and when we begin to live that love, truly our life would be a blessing. It would have been a good thing that we passed the way of the earth. Let's for a moment close our eyes. Lord, we ask you to remind us of your love, to open our eyes to see how glorious is your love. Lord, we pray, Lord, as we meditate on you, 
Fill us with your spirit. Transform us that we may be witnesses of your love in our homes, in our communities, and to the ends of the earth. Amen.